I'm Demi. And I'm Mr Sharp from Turner Schools Radio. We'll be interviewing five people who are standing for election to be the MP for Folkestone and Hive. Today we're joined by Bill Wright from the Reform UK Party. Welcome to Turner Schools Radio. Thank you. Briefly tell us about yourself. I'm 63 years old. I don't have any political experience, but local people are seeing that as an advantage, not a disadvantage. I graduated from Birmingham University in 1982 and I've worked solidly for 42 years across a range of industries covering health, IT, energy, engineering, construction and recently in ambulance driving work with the Red Cross. What are Reform's priorities? We have five major priorities. We feel that we need to get people back to work. There's too many people that could work but are choosing not to. So we have a policy that says you will not pay any tax whatsoever on your first £20,000 of earnings. We see a huge problem with the NHS. We, we've got a gap between demand from the population and what the NHS can actually deliver. Many millions of British people are concerned about the very high levels of immigration. That's legal immigration and illegal immigration, i.e. the people crossing the channel. We don't believe that net zero is a credible energy target. All it will mean is the poorest will feel the pinch. And finally, we're looking to reintroduce traditional policing methods such as putting police on the beat where they can prevent crime before it even starts. How would your party help the local area specifically? Specifically, we believe that uh, Folkestone and Hythe and New Romney are terrific places to be. We feel that um, taxes are too high, both income taxes that flow towards the government and local council taxes. We don't see enough value for money from the money that's being spent locally. So we would want to see less waste and better spending in accord with what real people want, not what the council think they want. Miss Cantor from Folkestone Academy asks how you would stop our rivers and seas from being polluted by sewage. This is an excellent point. Our solution is to engage local people to be officially designated monitors and when levels are exceeded they can trigger an official response against the water companies concerned. Mr Murphy, the head of Turner Schools, wants to know how you'd improve the education system of, for people living in poverty. For people living in poverty, the education system is often the only way out. So we believe in investing in schools and giving everybody the chance to realise their potential. We know that doesn't always include an academic route forward. We think that work of whatever nature is a route forward out of poverty and schools should be empowered to offer every child that opportunity. How would you attract more people to become teachers? The easy op option is to say pay them more and um, money always talks. So I've been a teacher in, in three university business schools. What makes a great teaching day is if the pupils are quiet focused, engaged, enthusiastic. Getting them into that state is far from easy, but firstly you've got to convince them that there's a point to what you're doing. You've got to sell them the opportunity that you're providing, whatever that is. And secondly, with younger people, I think it's important to have a high degree of discipline within the school. I'd reference the work of Catherine Burble Singh in a school called Michaela, in urban London where with simple principles of discipline and respect and tolerance she's achieved amazing results with a very very poor demographic of pupils. Teachers and other school staff are well versed in managing behaviour they've, they've been doing it for for years and very experienced in it. For what you're talking about in terms of a real change for many schools in how they manage um, behaviour can you see actually what would be quite a drastic change in how our schools feel to a much more disciplinarian environment? It's a very good point and your first, the first part of that I accept that it's the teachers are in the front line and politicians are not. For a school like this I would definitely want to respect 
the views of teachers who are experienced in this type of stuff. So it, we do feel that there is a discipline problem. We do feel that once discipline is looked after, it, everybody has a win-win. The worst thing that I've seen very occasionally with my children's upbringing is where discipline in class collapses and the losers are the kids trying to get on in life. So I do think there's um, opportunities to improve discipline. How that's achieved, I would certainly want to involve the teaching profession, but it does, in certain schools, I think it does need to be improved. Turning on to social media now, do you or your party think smartphones or social media should be banned from under 18s to improve mental health? I think that's an excellent point, but I would probably refer back to my previous answer. So that in the Michaela school, students coming into school check their phones in and at the end of the school day they checked out again. I think it's unrealistic to try and ban young people from using smartphones at all, completely. I don't think that's going to happen. But during the school day, I think it would be healthy for them to be off their phones and focus not only on lessons, but in regular face-to-face -face social interactions. Would your party change what schools teach? Two areas on that. We feel that British history has not been taught effectively in the last 10 years. There's far too much emphasis on um, the negatives and not enough emphasis on the positives. And if you trouble to research history, because I've read a lot of history because I like it, then you realise that the positives far outweigh the negatives and it's destructive to dwell on the negatives. Secondly, we are not in favour of what you might loosely call transgender ideology. We believe that gender is assigned at birth. You don't get to choose and children should not be told that that is an option for them. Having said that, we are very sympathetic towards either gay people or people that want to behave in a way different to their own sex. That's fine, but to suggest that they can actually change biological gender is dangerous and possibly a safeguarding issue. Currently, people don't directly pay for the NHS. It's funded from taxation. You propose looking at other models. If you get into power, when I grow up, will I need to pay for health insurance to see a doctor? Absolutely not. The, the model that we have is that the NHS should be free at the point of delivery. No British citizen should have to pay for medical treatment. But the difference between us and other parties is we don't believe the NHS needs to provide every single treatment. So, for example, if you're in need of a knee replacement when you get a little bit older, then there might be an independent clinic that can do your knee replacement better than the NHS hospital. In which case, we feel that the NHS should pay for your treatment because it's better for you and better for them. Secondly, if you do choose, and it would be an option, if you do choose to take out health insurance, such as Bupa, we have no problem with that because you've decided to pay for yourselves out of the freedom you have. If the private sector is more involved in healthcare and the private healthcare sector grows, um, Presumably that means that people who are currently working in the NHS would be tempted to leave for the private sector. How would you propose to keep the numbers of staff high enough in the NHS, especially considering at the moment that um, they're struggling to find people in many jobs? They are struggling to find people. That's no doubt about that. That's the fundamental problem between an excess of demand and limited capacity. One of our policies is to free up doctors and nurses and frontline staff from paying any income tax in the next two, possibly three years. That's intended to cement the NHS resource that we have because it will make a massive impact to their take-home pay and also attract new people into the NHS. We do realise that the NHS is under pressure 
and it's partly because they haven't got the capacity to meet the current demand. I want to move on to immigration now. Um, and your party, this is ju just one example, um, your party proposes to pick up illegal migrants out of boats and take them back to France. I'm wondering how this is going to work. Would you actually um, enter like French territorial waters and drop them off the beaches? Are there other ways of taking them back? How, would this actually happen? That's a great point. I get this question a lot on the streets. Um, I, I, I've been walking around Folkestone and High, the New Romney and the outlying villages, and people are incensed by these criminal, illegal people that are coming across on these small boats and expecting a life of Riley at the expense of the taxpayer, i.e. themselves. Well, some might be es escaping a war zone. There are options for them applying through regular channels rather than the dramatic way of crossing the channel. But coming back to your original point, Rishi Shunak, not unreasonably, but unrealistically, tried to bring in his deportation to Rwanda scheme. He promised flights in the spring, nothing happened, primarily due to the fact that he was um, hamstrung by the European Convention on Human Rights and our Human Rights Act. So Reform UK would immediately leave the European Convention on Human Rights, which would free us from foreign intervention in our legal system. We do believe that it's a mistake to let them land because once they're here, it's very difficult to get rid of them. So we do believe there is mileage in preventing them from landing at Dover or anywhere along the coast. That probably means patrolling our 12 mile limit and if necessary, taking them back to France and putting them back on the beaches where they came from. I do appreciate it's easier said than done, but we are prepared to try. Wouldn't that involve you going, taking them back into French territorial waters, which presumably the French wouldn't want you to go into? So how do you, how, how do you manage? Hence my original question, actually. How, how is that managed? It is a very difficult question. It needs to be ironed out. We are proposing to pay the French £500 million over three years. This is a Sunak deal that was agreed in March. So I think it's not unreasonable for the French to accept these people back rather than just want to see the back of them. How will you sort the cost of living crisis, in particular rent and energy bills? Rent first. Rent is clearly uh, another simple uh, relationship between supply and demand. This has not been helped by enormous levels of legal migration, two million in three years, that has put immense pressure on the rental market. This is not helped, in our opinion, by Conservative and Labour proposals to give tenants um, far greater rights. For example, to eliminate no-fault evictions. That sounds really nice, but what it does in practice is mean that landlords will withdraw from the market and exacerbate the supply and demand situation even further. With regard to cost of living, part of the cost of living problem is that the Conservative government have raised taxes on pretty much everything, so the tax burden on regular working people is about as high as it's ever been in our lifetimes. We would certainly want to reduce taxes to exempt people from paying tax on their first £20,000 of income. If you think that through, it, it benefits low-paid people disproportionately because, for example, if you're earning 24000 you'd only pay £800 a year in tax and keep the lion's share of your salary. Clearly, if you're earning £100,000 a year, you still benefit, but to a rather lesser extent. So we're hoping to do that. We're hoping to remove the energy subsidies that fund all these green projects, which are secretly added to everybody's energy bills, which is driving them up, and we're looking to reduce the cost of councils so that council tax should be coming down rather than up. You just mentioned um, saving money there and the net zero carbon target, which you propose to scrap. What sort of example do you think this sets the rest of the world that current prosperity is actually more important than the future of the planet. Is this the sort of message that we want to give out? It's a, it's a good point, but it all comes back, arguably, to feel-good virtual signalling. Britain, the UK, 
contributes less than 1% of global CO2 emissions. That's a documented fact. It's not my opinion. The main culprits in this situation are China, Russia, India and the United States. Together, they contribute over 57% of global emissions. So our little piece of the cake is so small that if the other guys are not on board with this, we don't feel that it's really worth impoverishing the British people over this. We are doing more than our bit, in our opinion, and to go further would just cause a load of cost to be dumped on the poorest without making any significant impact on the global situation at all. Recently, the IFS said of a number of parties, in, including yours, basically they, they questioned the figures and whether they add, added up. Uh, they said the claims for how much you'd spend, I think, are not attainable considering how you um, want to cut taxes. On a personal level, I'm talking about you here, would you like to see slightly higher taxes to make your what you want to do work or actually deliver slightly less on what you planned? Is taxation or delivery more important for you? Great question. Um, looking at you, David, I'm not quite sure whether you were around at the time of Margaret Thatcher. I certainly was. I turned yes, I was. Yeah, yeah. I, I turned 18 when she came to power, so I was at a pivotal time of my life. And a pivotal fact with Mrs Thatcher was when she reduced the basic rate of income tax from 33% down to 29%, the government experienced an increase in tax revenue. Why was that? Because more people felt it was worthwhile to go out to work and those in work felt it was worthwhile to do more work, i.e. overtime. This is a fundamental part of our plan to shift people from not working, being economically inactive, to get them into some kind of work and make it work th worth their while. So you want to cut taxes. Would you grow the armed forces and how? Definitely. I had a Ukrainian mother and daughter living with me for 18 months and they decided to go home and I went and visited them last year. I saw the situation in Ukraine and what I saw in Ukraine was a nation fighting for its freedom against unprovoked Russian invasion, which is a reminder that the first duty of government is to protect its citizens. We used to have armed forces that were the envy of the world. Owing to the fact they were not priorities for successive governments, they've been run down and we feel that's put us in a dangerous situation to respond, for example, to Russian aggression and possibly to Iranian aggression in the future. And we're quite happy to support a rise in expenditure to 2.5% of GDP, rising to 3%. We need to put some steel back into our armed forces. They know what they need to do. They just need the resources to be able to do it. Bill Wright, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank it's been you. a pleasure, Demi.